And I think this is something that most cities do struggle with, is that right balance between different modes of transportation. And if we think of the human scale for first in terms of the foremost um, uh, element in terms of how we design the cities, and that starts to shape the environment, starts to change the way in which we think about our urban space. This is everything from the Automobile Act, transportation authorities, missions and mandates, land use mix and urban policy, and the impact to the physical design then of our streets, the buildings and the required support facilities that really allow for this type of active mobility to happen on a daily basis. And we start to think about how to make walking and cycling the most effective and convenient mode of transportation. Now one of the things that the group started to look at was some of the benefits and the spectrum of benefits that happen from being more active and promoting walking and cycling. And these are a few of the kind of key things that came out in terms of safety, affordability, health, higher quality of life. There are many others in terms of both private sector and public sector benefits. Um, we also looked at a lot of uh, the, the negativity and the roadblocks to active mobility. And Lehman, Lehman, he will go through a few of these. Yeah. Can I have the mobile? Okay, good. Um, okay, I'll do it from here, so I'm closer to you. Okay, I want to ask you a question. Do you think your city is designed for people or for cars? So who, whose city is designed for people? Whose city is designed for cars? You see, we, we still live in a world where many of our cities are designed for cars. The infrastructural framework, the legislative frameworks are all designed for the efficiency of moving cars and motorized traffic through the streets and when that is actually the way that we man, uh, measure the efficiency of our transportation system, the kinds of systems that require uh, prioritizing people such as sidewalks, bike paths, do not get funding or are evaluated for their effectiveness and their benefits are not so clear. Uh, in this sense to many cities. So Yen Gale, you know, if one message he keeps repeating to us is that we have to put people first rather than cars. And uh, in our little site study of Ang Mo Kyo, um, we, we actually, uh, which is actually a new town that has not uh, have uh, cycling infrastructure implemented yet, uh, we found a few things uh, that we thought could be improved, and uh, that would be, um, you know, this thing that uh, Professor Gale has called mini highways, in the sense that many of the roads are designed for cars to pass quickly through with no interruptions of traffic light, and people and bicycles have to go across, you know, a major barrier such as an overhead bridge, you know, in order to cross the street. And the other idea here is that if the junctions are not safe, the network is not complete. So junctions are big interruptions to the continuity of pedestrian walkways to bike paths. And what, what it does is that it makes traffic very efficient, but it actually deeper uh, prioritizes people in the city. And the other thing is that um, end of trip amenities are very short to come by. There are not enough bicycle parking infrastructure or uh, considerations about showers at the workplace uh, and, or at MRT stations and so on. And so how do we move forward? I don't think the debate is about you know, um, taking away car all the cars from the city and making city entirely pedestrian oriented, but to find a good uh, balance and a good ecosystem uh, and diversity where uh, we want to maximize the idea of urban mobility and provide ad uh, good solutions and good alternatives so that you find the best way for you to get around the city and most of it, it would be through people-powered uh, mobility. So we came up with 10 ideas for creating people-friendly walking and cycling cities. Um, the first one is really about um, uh, making it convenient and efficient because if it's not convenient, people will not use it. So in this sense, uh, it's necessary to integrate uh, biking and walking well with transit nodes and also to perhaps provide bike share facilities. 
Number two, provide dedicated space for all. It's necessary to provide, um, to minimize conflict and to provide safety for pedestrians, bicycles, away from traffic that, traffic that moves at different speed. Ensure visibility at junctions. We have to ensure that junctions are designed, as I said earlier, for continuity of pedestrian and bike paths and that there is very clear visibility for uh, between different modes of transport. Number four, um, ensure continuity of movement. We, such as the idea of the continuous sidewalk where people actually uh, go across the sidewalk, the car has to cross a sidewalk and not people crossing the street. The same for bicycles, right? And then number five, um, keep it slow. Um, many cities uh, have implemented uh, ideas such as Vision Zero in New York City, um, which uh, is actually inspired by Sweden where traffic is uh, slowed down to about uh, 20, 20 miles per hour and um, the mayor of Melbourne shared with us yesterday that uh, on streets that show, uh, slowed down traffic to 40 kilometers per hour, there has been no fatalities uh, from as compared with the past. So that's very important. Number six, um, uh, sorry, um, create a continuous uh, crossing, as I said, at great crossing instead of making people cross overhead bridges as, uh, or making bicycles. You know, you have to bring your bicycle up to the bridge. Uh, number seven, um, have a consistent design standard so that people are not confused when they use the cycling paths and pedestrian paths throughout a city. Number eight, prioritize, um, prioritize and make, make um, cycling and pedestrian infrastructure attractive. So we have, in, in the tropical context, we have to plant more trees and to um, integrate these well with uh, other amenities. Number nine, mix it up, mix up the users. Um, Mayor Melbourne yesterday shared with us again that um, um, people are not able to shop when they drive a car. You can't try on a pair of shoes when you're driving, but when you're cycling and you're walking, you can have a much more interactive environment, much more engaging, attractive, and uh, more sociability. And uh, number 10, um, we have to make sure that there are adequate end-of-trip amenities, such as, as I said earlier on, showers, uh, enough bicycle parking amenities, and so on. So that's the 10 ideas which we, uh, you'll be able to find in the e-publication that you download. And so, you know, to conclude, uh, especially for our tropical context, it's necessary to um, try to have a continuous, um, if you're cycling, that you are able to go continuously without stopping, because stopping is when you have to expend the most energy to start and stop. And if you integrate this well with your transit amenities, uh, that also makes the movement, the intermodal movement, very much more smooth. Um, and for our tropical conditions, it's necessary to have a lot of planting and uh, for, you know, to make bike paths and uh, walking paths uh, much more, a much more attractive environment to go through. And of course, the end of trip amenities, shower in the workplace, bicycle parking, and also, you know, um, all of you are not dressed for cycling. You have to ditch your, your, your shirts, uh, your suits and your ties in order to survive in this climate if you want to get walking and cycling so there might, might have to be a rethink of the kind of corporate culture that we have here and and um, uh, Gail sh shared with us that many cities really start their cycling movements uh, as a recreation as we have done our park connector system has been able to attract many people to cycling in Singapore but how do you turn cycling from something you do, you do on Sunday do something you do on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. So that, that is the challenge for many cities. And his last word again, that uh, cities should be for people and not for cars. I would very much like to thank um, everyone who participated with the workshops, with the material. Many of you are in this room today that had fun on the bikes and 
had fun in the dialogue that was created, and really a dialogue about active mobility in a tropical city. So I uh, greatly appreciate your support with our, our research and our outcomes. With that, what we'd like to do is invite the response panel up to the stage, and we will have them then respond based on their own experiences and based on what they've seen today. So if I could ask the Right Honourable Lord Mayor Robert Doyle from Melbourne to come to the stage. His Excellency Redwan Kamal, Mayor of Bandun. Uh, Professor Yang Gale, founding partner of Gale Architects. And Marilyn Taylor, uh, Dean and Pilot Professor, University of Pennsylvania School of Design and former chairman of Urban Land Institute. I think Lord Mayor uh, Robert Doyle has been instrumental in leading cycling initiatives in Melbourne and transforming uh, the transformation of Swanson Street, uh, which we heard a little bit about yesterday, into a very pedestrian-friendly, um, accessible space. And so what we're going to do here is actually we're going to try to keep this to five minutes of response time, um, and then we're going to open it up for discussion and questions from the floor. So actually, Lord Mayor, if I can start with you, and you have five minutes, sir, to respond. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about something completely different from what I thought I was going to talk about today. And it really comes, in, and the Mayor and I, I think, probably have the same perspective. And that is that there are many people in this room who are absolute zealots about cycling and walking and do not have to be convinced about the benefits of it and would turn our cities into cycling and walking cities tomorrow. And that's great. But we have to deal with a much wider population. And therefore, the importance of explaining to people why you are doing this so that they feel comfortable with the changes to their city is particularly important. In the city of Melbourne, when I was first elected, we undertook a project uh, where we closed a kilometre of our main civic spine to traffic, to private cars. It has trams, it has cycles, it has pedestrians and it has some deliveries in it. Um, led by our, our wonderful Director of Urban Design, Professor Rob Adams, who's, who's here today. If I know anything about urbanism at all, and it's not much, the little I do know I've learned from Rob Adams and Jan Gell, so that part I'm on the right track. And then as a, a second element, there is a bridge which comes over the Yarra River and joins with that main civic spine, Prince's Bridge. And what we did was we decided that cycling across that was very dangerous, very narrow, high traffic volumes, trams in the middle so the cars are constrained and a raised footpath for pedestrians and bikes were sharing that space with pedestrians. So after advice from our traffic engineers, what we did was we closed one of the inbound lanes for cars and converted it to bikes. So we had pedestrians on the footpath bikes in a dedicated lane, one lane of cars, and then the trams travelling down the busiest tram route in the world. And we could show that although the queues were longer, in fact, you got through the intersection in roughly the same time. Now, here's the important part about the political discourse. The very day I left to come to this conference, in one of our great metropolitan newspapers, there was an article saying how this experiment on the bridge was a failure, that it actually held up traffic for far too long and that what I should do is give that lane back to cars. Okay? And there was an accompanying editorial arguing that we had got this model wrong, the numbers didn't stack up and we should essentially take it back to the way it was. On the same day, in the opposing great metropolitan newspaper in Melbourne, there was an article and a letter that said, clearly I didn't understand the needs of the city because using that major intersection every day were 20,000 cars and, sorry, yeah, 20,000 cars and 100,000 pedestrians. So obviously I had not gone far enough in closing down intersections of the city for the use of pedestrians and cyclists. So I had one of our newspapers saying, Robert, you idiot, you didn't go far enough. And the other paper saying, Robert, you idiot, you've gone far too far. <laughs> now obviously I'm a failure as a politician because what I hadn't done, I haven't, and I go back and I'll do it, I promise you, there does need to be, even when good research like this is done, and it meets what we think meets the common sense test, there is a need for a political discourse that talks to our people that says we are making changes to our city, we're making changes to the way you move around our city, there are good reasons for it, all the ones that you know. But I guess my perspective would be, even when such great research is done and there is political will to do it, and there are demonstrable benefits that will flow, don't underestimate the importance of the political conversation that you need to have with the wider community so that that is not just accepted, but is supported. 
I wish I'd been better at it. That way I might have only had one article rather than both, but still. <laughs> uh, very good. Thank you. Um, and, and very much in time. <laughs> Um, so maybe if I can turn to His Excellency Ridwan Kamal. Uh, Ridwan is an architect, lecturer, and a social activist. Uh, he was very much instrumental, actually, in Jakarta's urban framework, as well as in Bandung through um, his practice. He's recently been elected um, uh, mayor of Bandung. It's been in term for about eight months now. Um, and he's already embarked on several very key initiatives that are transforming his urban fabric in the city of Bandung. Uh, Ridwan, please. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. Before I uh, become a mayor, I was a practicing architect and urban designer also. So I advising cities and design buildings. Uh, when I uh, went home 2003, after working for an uh, international firm, uh, I see my city need to be uh, pushed into new ideas. So uh, I founded the Bandung bike sharing movement. The first bike sharing like in uh, New York or in uh, Paris, but initiated by community. Because that time I tried to convey, to convey the message that uh, cycling is important, but the message is not uh, received well. So we decided we go to companies to support us for this uh, initiative. Now, since I'm a mayor now, so I'm putting this agenda uh, into a city policy. Uh, when I see the uh, presentation also, uh, we learn that we don't have uh, a departments uh, in my uh, administration to deal with of people walking or cycling, mostly about traffic, about cars, about anything. So I now also uh, creating a master plan, we call it Bandung Urban Mobility Projects is everything about dealing with uh, moving people. Uh, number one, of course, uh, Bandung is still in the developing stage. We are preparing for monorail system for public transportation. Bandung also a hilly. Uh, uh, we're preparing also cable car uh, in the hilly, like uh, Medellin in, in South America. We are preparing, of course, the pedestrian upgrading, uh, very basic. Uh, bike sharing would be our ambitious project. Uh, we uh, try to install in many places, including hotels. So hotels and shelter will be connected because we are a touristic city. Six million tourists coming to my city. And uh, I have to deal with something, uh, mobility also for the tourists. Uh, also, we have inspired by Hong Kong. I lived in Hong Kong for two years. So I work in Central, working in the Skywalk. So now we, uh, I'm happy to announce uh, this year we started our Bandung Skywalk projects. It's a series of bridges crisscrossing the city so people can walk and cycling uh, without interfering with, with cars uh, to go places in, in, in Bandung. Uh, I think this kind of uh, gesture from policy is really, for me, uh, driven from my experience, my patience also, about how to make my city of 2.5 million populations moving into new way of mobility. Uh, only 20% Currently, uh, my population is using public transport. So 80% using cars and motorbikes. So how to flip this in the next five years? The 80% become non-cars, non-motorbikes, and 20% uh, using the private cars. So something uh, is a big homework for me to do that. And I think as a city leader now, uh, the best leadership is uh, leadership by examples. So when I promote bicycling, uh, I bike to work every day since day one of my office until eight months. I consistently uh, travel 20 kilometers back and forth from my home to my office. Uh, it's not I want to do this, but I need to do this. Uh, I have always three best experience when I'm cycling. Number one, for some reason, good ideas comes when I cycling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I meet people, I stop under the trees, I go to uh, a mysterious alley in my city and finding interesting. So lots of ideas of fixing my city come when I'm cycling every morning. Second, I meet my people, I greet them, I stop, I say hello, I smile, I touch the, the, uh, the situation with, with heart and talking. 
and third is healthy of course yeah. so uh, therefore we campaign in Bandung Friday is a bike, a bike to work day yeah. so Bandung has a call Bandung fun days I want to change Bandung day by day Monday is a free bus day so a free bus for all the students no need to pay uh, Tuesday is uh, no smoking day in Bandung forbidden to smoke in Bandung every Tuesday Wednesday is local Sundanese day is local culture day I wear local uniform speaking local language to, to focus on culture uh, Thursday is English day for my people to be ready for global competition Friday is bike to work day so this is uh, I give incentive to students who bike to school giving them a, a, a voucher to dinner with mayors if you bicycle uh, most of the time every day yeah so maybe that could be a challenge to the Lord Mayor in terms of getting to work every day. So I think uh, this kind of reform is in place, uh, which I think mobility is important beyond cars and motorbikes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, now I'll turn to Marilyn Taylor, who is recognized really as a, a true thought leader in urban design and planning. Uh, she's uh, first an architect and a woman who served as chairman of Urban Land Institute from 2005 to 2007 and she has championed a lot of redevelopment for cities around the world. Um, Marilyn, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna make uh, three quick points. They're sort of interrelated. The uh, first thing is that I think it's really fabulous. When I first came to start working on projects in Singapore, which was quite a long time ago because there wasn't a subway yet, and so that's the first project I came here to work on, it was astounding to me how quickly you got the answer, oh, we can't do that in Singapore because we don't go outdoors. We take our, we take, we have air-conditioned stations, we <clears throat> ride in air-conditioned cars, we occasionally hang out in shade under the uh, arcade of a building, and this was a long time ago, and a lot has changed. And so the first thing I wanna say is thank you for believing in the out of doors the gardens by the bay, the fabulous walks along the river. I mean, I and I do remember the one time I went outside here, it was for uh, the Mooncake Festival, and it was around uh, the center of the harbor before things had been extended out. And people were having a wonderful time, and you could suddenly see the diversity of Singapore, and as you could see, as the mayor of Medellin just said, that, that when people claim the streets, streets become active, and live and you know that the city is yours. And, and so where we are some decades later from the first project I'm working here is talking about riding a bike in a tropical circumstance. And so it's a fantastic report. The first thing I would do is, is figure out a way to carry that forward. And I have a suggestion for you so that we can continue to make the case that as, as Jan does with his spectacular picture of the Danes riding through snowstorms on their bikes to go to work that it is not, it's not limited here. And the recreational path is one thing because you're dressed in your clothes for being out of doors, but it can be made to work, especially with appropriate facilities at the end. The second thing is, and it, it, maybe it seems trivial to say this, but besides being an architecture, I'm really, a, I, I am passionate about infrastructure and its importance to shaping cities. I think that's more about urban design now than the than the precise width of the street in relation to the volume of the height. We kind of like difference and variety in our urban environments, but anything that brings people into the public space in a way where there's a willingness to share it, I think is great. And, and so I would say, why do I say it's, I say, why is it a system? Why is it an infrastructure? Precisely because of all the points you made. You can't just give a kid a bike and say, go ride. Uh, we know that there has to be a reallocation of the pavement, hopefully not an expansion of the pavement to do these things. We know that if you have a bike system, we discovered this in New York, I think we knew it, but I had, don't think we paid quite enough attention. You know, bikes don't automatically get resorted by multiple trips back to the dock that you got your city bike from. <coughs> and there have to be trucks at night that redistribute the bicycles back to the sending locations from the receiving locations. And it's kind of like, think about it, it's like baggage carts at airports. Everybody needs a baggage to cart to go out, but not necessarily to come back in. So uh, there's a lot of thinking to be done in order to make a bike system sort of as useful as zip cars are to us now. I don't know if you have zip cars here, but that notion that one car 
replaces 10 privately owned vehicles when you optimize a sharing system is really an extraordinary thing. And we as architects and you now as a mayor hate building parking spaces if we don't need them. We would rather have it for park spaces. So, but it's a system for people. It needs its own rational organization. And in particular, now maybe I don't have to say this here in Singapore, but in New York we had to say, it. you know, you really can't go the wrong way on a bikeway either. You have to be ticketed. You have to, uh, uh, you can cause serious problems if you don't have the same sort of respect for the path that we as drivers were taught to have for the road. To your point, Mr. Mayor, I, I think um, I have learned from working with Transport for London and the way that they organize their various infrastructures and evaluate the service that's provided. There are these things called KPIs, Key Performance Indicators. And what we learned in New York was it was important to understand what those were. So we had businesses screaming and yelling, if you take the cars away, if we can no longer park on the street because we are preferring bicycles for that space, my retail sales are gonna go down. And oh, by the way, bicycles aren't pedestrians and so bikes streaming by are gonna take my retail sales down. Well, in fact, it's exactly the opposite. The retail sales go up. People are happy being out there. It's much more convenient to uh, strap your bike to a post uh, safely out of the bike path. And, and so I think by being smart about what you think you're going to be asked and compiling the data and keeping it coming, you can effectively, what do I wanna say, offer compelling data that at least changes the nature of the dialogue. And I know that's been successful in so many cities on so many other things, so let's not forget it when we, when we talk about bikes. And another interesting thing is, when do people ride? That's trackable too. Uh, if, we all, if we have an app with an iPhone, you can tell where everybody is. You don't have to disclose their name, rank, and serial number, but it will be easier to understand and to make the case for, well, maybe in Singapore people don't ride in the rain, but maybe they do ride even in the middle of the day if there are frequent areas of shade and rest along the path. So I think there are a number of things to think about, but I really applaud this as one of what I think is the major transformations to reclaiming a much larger percentage of our paved surface for people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, and the final respondent is Yang Gale, um, who is uh, incredibly involved with major cities around the world on the transformation. Um, he's an architect by background and urban designer and has been very, very involved with uh, creating a 30 plus mode chair of cycling in Copenhagen over the years. Yang, please. First, I would like to congratulate uh, the Center for Livable Cities and ULI for the work you have done here. I'm very impressed. I was part of some of the workshops and uh, I will see the trembling person on, the, on one of the bikes. Um, and I am very impressed, and I think I've learned quite a few extra things which we will have to apply in other cities. So congratulations, and go and do it. Great. I would rather now talk about, uh, we are sitting here on an island which is 20 by 42 kilometers, or something like that. I also heard that you have a drawbridge to Malaysia, so where very few cars go across, but the train go, that's fine. Keep it a drawbridge. We have an island which is rather small. There are five million people on this island. And I had earlier this day a little workshop. It was only uh, sort of two people, maybe there were three or four, but anyway, it was very small. And we talked about 2050. And these are news for all of you because Singapore will be one of the first cities where they get rid of the motor car as a personal transportation thing. Because here will be the best city in the world for public transportation. And because public transportation and good public realm, they are closely related. So Singapore will have fantastic public realm for bicycling and walking all over this small little island. And it will have a fantastic public transportation system where you can take your bikes and you can take your wheelchairs and that 
um, so that you, you have a fantastic public transportation season and you realize that there will hardly be room for having private cars on such a small island with so many people. You also have a very dense structure of building, so it is a perfect place to develop public transportation and people city. And we are talking about something like 2050, maybe 2040, but it's obvious that world is moving this way. We, um, we are increasingly <coughs> interested in making livable cities, having focus on people. We are told, and we know we have to address the climate challenge, and we are told by World Health Organization that every city shall make their citizens walk and bike as much as possible to keep the world healthy and the health costs down. And here we have the perfect solution. By 250, Singapore will be the main exporter in the world of fantastic public transportation system, and they will be experts on livable cities. They have had for years this slogan, a tropical city of excellence, and it will only be better and better day for day from now on. And I come from a city which have Copenhagen, where we have um, a, a public policy. We will be the best city for people in the world. Here we have a country. We would be the best city for people, best country for people in the world. You have a fantastic situation, and I think that the movement has started. We know we cannot put more asphalt on such a small island. And we know we have to rethink and we can do much better for people. We have an aging population and, and they have special needs and they cannot go by car and they may be immobile unless we improve the public realms all over an island like this one. I look much forward to come back again and again in the next 50 years and see all this transformation. It will be one of the best places in the world. You have fantastic opportunities. You have started well. Thank you. Got Lots luck. of positive optimism there. Very positive optimism. Thank you. I, if I can maybe just stay with the panel for a couple more minutes and ask if there's any other comments or responses to uh, what, was, what was just discussed. Uh, Lord Mayor. You want to say something? Well, I mean, it's up to you. If I'm you a want politician. To you invite me to say something, I'll say something. You know, <laughs> even if I haven't thought of it just yet. But um, Look, the, the other part is that, that you do need to do the planning. I mean, we have a cycle plan. We have a walking plan. Um, some parts of that are controversial, but you need to send it out to your community and say, this is what we intend to do. The difficulty we find with cycling is that, and this is almost facile, of course, when we laid down our city, the, the tram tracks were laid down, and we have the largest tram network in, in the world. And the road system was laid down for, for cars and vehicles, and the footpaths were laid down for pedestrians. There wasn't any such coherent infrastructure for bikes. So what we've tended to do in cities is put in bits here and there, piecemeal. And that doesn't really work. So what we've had to do is think more clearly about what is a coherent and connected network of cycle paths. Now that means for us, that it's not going to be ideal. Some of them are separated lanes, some of them are painted chevrons, some of the lines on the road, depending on the road space. But the overall intention is to create a connected network of those bike lanes for cycling. In Melbourne, one of the prevailing cultures we, we don't necessarily encourage is the culture of cycling, which is young men completely decked out in lycra, on a racing bike, heads down, backsides up, going very quickly. You know, now for 2% of the population, that's a very comfortable way to, to travel. But what we found was when we started to build these, these bike lanes that were safer, we got more upright cycling. We got more young women and older people cycling because they felt safer. And the other great weapon that, that you use in the conversation, and, and it's, I don't mean this to be disrespectful in any way. Um, when I was first Lord Mayor, we had a young woman, uh, Carolyn Rawlings was her name, who was killed quite horrifically in, in Swanson Street on her cycle by a bus. And every time there's opposition to us putting in more of this network, taking away more of road space for cars, you remind people that in the end, human life and preventing serious injury comes a long way ahead of motorist convenience. And when you actually put it in that sort of perspective 
and you remind them of the importance of that element, quite a lot of opposition melts away. I would like to, at this time, turn it open to the floor. If there's any questions from you for the panelists, please. If you could um, say your name and uh, where you're from, and then question. Uh, I want to, to ask this to Mr. Yanga. I was in Copenhagen a few weeks ago, and then actually I saw a, a significant difference between a European city and Asian city. Uh, besides the challenge of the climate and then the infrastructure, uh, the grassroots that I see is the people behavior. So uh, I saw in Copenhagen the motorist is respect the cyclist, the cyclist respect the pedestrian. But uh, in the other hand, in Asia, I don't really see that things. And then uh, my question is, uh, what is the basic thing? Uh, how to change these people's behavior? Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Ritwan already mentioned that uh, it starts from the leader, how to, use, to, how to promote the uh, bicycle. But maybe is there any other thing to, to do? Maybe Yang, if you could start, and then uh, Ridwan, maybe you could follow on, giving the Asian context. The answer is time. It takes time uh, for bicycle culture to develop. It takes time for society to accept that there are lots of bicycles. And we've found that the more bicycles there are, the safer it is to go bicycling, and the more the motorists will have to respect the, and look out for the bicyclists all the time. And the bicyclists will also be more and more experienced in bicycling and it will be safer and safer. So it's a matter of, the, of starting and get involving this culture so that, that we are a different type of people in the traffic and in the streets. Uh, I think that's the answer to your question. I, I would always say education, examples, best practice, that to show people what they do in other cities and what could be done and what the problems are and show it very clearly so that people can understand it rather than having government policies and whatever, it's uh, information, education and telling about why it's so important. I think it's, it's very interesting, say in Sydney, that all over Sydney they have these posters we do all this about walking and cycling to make a better climate in this world. So we do this for mankind. So they inform people why this is happening. And so I think it's very important with information uh, rather than having policies. I have seen the policies in Moscow and it works because they have very efficient democracy. But, um, <laughs> um, but I, I believe that, that information and education is a very efficient way, and time. It takes Mayor, time. Mayor Kamel. I agree with Professor John. It takes some time. Yeah. I've been eight months cycling every day, and thank God I'm safe and sound. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no single accident, even though some skeptics say, oh, Mr. Mayor, it's very dangerous to, to cycle in Bandung. But uh, I, I want to show that if I survive, then at least the rest of the <laughs> people will see that everything's okay. Yeah. When it comes to education, it's hard for us to, to change the mindset because it's been there for years that people mobility is identical with private cars and motorbikes. Yeah. So uh, I'm using a, a cultural approach. Uh, is uh, we call it ethnography marketing. Yeah, is is we really into the mind of people. People in Bandung love door prize. Yeah, so if you go to to Bandung for seminar, uh, they stick at the end at until the end of the seminar because of at the end of seminar we still have door prize, so people can sit uh, uh, and listening. So this door prize theory I'm using to campaign for people to more uh, cycling. For example. Uh, in our bike to school projects, I told the headmaster, please uh, give rewards to all students who bike to work 
in a majority of days in a month if they can collect uh, points for example yeah at the end of the year I will have door price for iPad for uh, mobile phone and something related to, to that one this reward kind of concept uh, in last eight months is very powerful so uh, again when it comes to education it takes time but we not give up to, to, to use this one uh, as a means of uh, changing the civilization if I ask my people say hey uh, please uh, walk and bike to work uh, for the sake of uh, city civilization they will not do that <laughs> but when I said hey if your point is uh, very high at the end of the day uh, at the end of the year uh, the price is going to Europe trip for example and they do that so I think uh, is it comes to uh, understanding the locality to educate uh, and persistent would be my my goals to, to achieve this. We, we don't have just a, a just a quick note. I was going to say, okay, so the University of Pennsylvania in the city of Philadelphia has students coming from 27 countries. We have a how do you ride a bike in the city class because uh, it's, it's not mandatory. It's just there. Uh, there's a saying that once you know how to ride a bike, just get on and you know how to ride a bike. That's not true anymore. The brakes are different. The rules of the road are different. Uh, there are signals for bikes. There are hand signs for bikes. I mean, we work really uh, as, as well as we can to make sure that in a generous, non-mandatory way, uh, the uh, students are brought to be uh, in, uh, in closer awareness of the right way to do some of these things. And I have to say, it doesn't even have to be governmental regulation in a way, if you suddenly start riding the wrong way on a bar bike path, people will tell you, whoa, you better fix that, turn around, get going the other way. And, and so there is, conversely though, there is, you have to educate people to watch out for the bikes. Uh, I nearly broke a leg uh, when I stepped out into the bike path in Sweden, in Stockholm, because uh, uh, they were pretty serious about the way they were going. So it is a mutual respect for sharing space. But I also think a good dose of available education about you know, how, you, how you do these things is pretty important, especially when you talk about people of all ages or people from different cultures integrating in the bike system. We, two very specific answers, because I agree with you on time. Education first. We have a shared space between pedestrians and cyclists by our river. We set up a stop where we actually stopped cyclists and interacted with them personally and with pedestrians as well. And all of the research and the data shows that is the most effective intervention because those people use that path every day. So it's individualised uh, stopping and talking to those people and giving them information. So that's cyclists and pedestrian sharing. Information and education as well. You may remember the, the terrible uh, accident in Germany when... Uh, a car, a very young person, inexperienced driver, ploughed into a group of Olympic cyclists, um, Australian Olympic cyclists. A young woman called Amy Gillette was, was killed. Um, her family have embarked on uh, a, a campaign of information and education for drivers about the space they need to leave between their vehicle and the bike. And, and that is a very specific education and information campaign. So there are two ways that you can intervene while you're waiting for that culture to develop. Uh, Prof Gill, you wanted to add? I, I, must, I could say that I was extremely surprised when I was invited to come with some from my team for a bicycle workshop in Singapore. Because that's too hot and too humid and it's not on to bike there. So I was very surprised. I know more about it now. And I saw in some of the suburbs, I saw very impressive uh, levels of bicycling um, and then there's an important point when we talk about bicycling here that is I don't think we shall talk about commuting on bike on 15 kilometer uh, for several half hours I think we are talking about a lot of small rides of two kilometer three kilometer to the station to the to the uh, supermarket whatever so a lot of the local stuff can be done but the long distance will have to be in the public transportation where you can take your bike along and be taken for the long distance and there can be a bit of cooling in the train and the short distance the bicycle is very obvious also in very hot climate in all parts of the day and I've also this spring been to a similar seminar in Greenland 
and you say, no, you can't do it here because it's too cold and too slippery. But they insist it, and they do. So it's very interesting that we can live with the climate, and we have to adopt. But spicing is a smart way of you use very little personal energy. You use one third of what energy you use when you walk, and you use one sixtieth of energy as compared to you in a car. So bicycling is a very smart way of getting, and here it's, it's obvious for the not too long rides, but the small rides, fine. <laughs> well, we, we don't have a door prize for you, but we do have alcohol <laughs> waiting. Um, <laughs> I guess that's our, our way of attracting. Uh, is there another question from the floor? Yes, please. Please state your name. Hi, I'm um, Hannah Vandenberg. I'm an urban planner from the Netherlands. And, um, well, first of all, I would like to say that I'm, I'm very inspired by the, uh, by the work that has been done here, the research project, and by the ideas and the, um, yeah, the direction that this, this work is going in. Um, I'm actually going to be moving to Singapore for two years. So I look forward to being able to cycle here as well, Bring the way bike. I do in the Netherlands. <laughs> um, and there's actually something that I would like to uh, share with you, if I may. Um, I saw that one of the uh, points and something that came up in the discussion now as well was making cycling more convenient and more comfortable. And of course there is a lot of uh, climatic challenges here in Singapore when it comes to cycling. Um, in the Netherlands we have a lot of rain. It's obviously not as um, uh, extreme events as, as, as we have here in Singapore. Um, but this minor change that they've made in some cities in Holland um, to make cycling more comfortable is that they've added uh, sensors to the traffic lights, water sensors, so that when it rains, the traffic lights actually uh, switch to green for uh, cyclists earlier than they do when it's dry. So when the weather is dry, it's just equal, and it's just a, a normal, um, it's, it's regulated in a normal way, but when it rains, cyclists actually get preference, so they have to wait at the traffic lights less. So it would be very interesting, I think, for Colors. Singapore to think of Ideas like that using innovative technologies. Um, Anyone from LTA here? <laughs> <laughs> they were part of a workshop. Actually, the young guy who's jumping up and down in the video, very animated, <laughs> he's the LTA planner. He's very passionate. Excellent. All right. But yeah, so I, I don't actually have a, a question, something just I wanted to share and a, and a compliment. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Oh, here. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Caitlin Scanlon. I'm an international fellow at the School of Design and Environment at Nian Polytechnic. Uh, and I've lived in Singapore for almost a year now. Uh, and I just sort of had a question open to anyone. Uh, whether, uh, well, I'll preface this with saying, uh, I'm, I'm very, as an American, I'm very impressed by how safe it is in Singapore, uh, especially at night. Uh, you can get home late and you can walk home without a problem. You can take a taxi. If you're lucky, you catch the MRT before you come home. So I was wondering if this study also addressed uh, safety and transportation at night. Um, Ms. Taylor, you addressed sort of, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania, so uh, traveling in Philly terrifies me. Uh, and I can only imagine an international student in Philadelphia would be strongly encouraged uh, to take this sort of bike class. So I wondered if, uh, you know, if a class like that would not only be encouraged, but almost required uh, in a place like Singapore. Well, I, I see cyclists around and I say, boy, they are very gutsy. So two things. One, sort of certification or standards, safety standards that cyclists should know. But also traveling at night, uh, putting in lights or sensors, solar panels. Uh, does the study address that, or is it something well, for future research? No, we, we talked, uh, well, actually, we talked quite a bit about safety, because one of the, the big issues on the, on the uh, the bike shop we stopped at a school and one of the things that we kept hearing from a lot of people was uh, they don't like the kids to cycle to school because of safety and then that opened a whole discussion about safety and um, it, time of night rain um, visibility and then uh, with the children though it was very interesting because around that that school is a large HDB uh, public housing um, community with a large population a lot of children but yet children weren't able to cycle from the residence to the school. And the school, the way in which the school was just physically designed, 
has only one or two in and outs, which are for automobile and buses to come in and out, and nothing separate for bicycles or even to allow children to park their bike. So we did talk about safety, and it is part of one of the chapters in terms of the safety part. Uh, do you want to add? The, the part about parking in school, um, I, we heard a good story from someone who related that uh, his principal sort of required that they go for a one-day safety course before he gets permission for a parking lot for his bicycle in school. And I thought that was a brilliant idea because it ensured that the kid is going to cycle safely and then he gets a place to park in the school. So there are all sorts of little initiatives like this. But I think the idea about night cycling uh, is something we do have to give more thought to because I, I myself have started cycling to work uh, like one day or two days a week, I, I'll try to increase it and maybe I want to start a campaign called Bike to Work inspired by <laughs> me and Rita One. Um, but uh, when it gets too late, there, there are some uh, dangers about visibility and even, you know, although Singapore is safe, there are still spooky paths that I have to go through that is more a psychological fear rather than a real one. So, so we do have to address that, yes. Thank you. Well, in I think. Sorry, can I just yeah, go ahead. In, in Australia, the cycling and walking to school has, has dropped dramatically uh, over the decades, and one of the principal reasons is safety. Um, the other part of the, the study was about walking. One thing that we did in, in Melbourne, which I thought was very smart, um, parents developed a walking bus. So, what they do is gather a group of, of school children, you know, primary school children in particular. You might have 15 or 20 of them from the neighbourhood, and a couple of parents walk with them to school. So, it's a walking bus. And, and in that way, they, they, uh, they felt safe because, of course, there were adults with them. But it encouraged the children to walk to and from school rather than have their parents drive them even a short distance. So you can get a fun idea together like that, then, then you actually get the benefits of what we're talking about, but you obviate the, the concerns and the quite natural concerns about safety of young children in particular. Thank you. I think this has been a very good conversation. And the intention is actually to exit out here. There's uh, some food and beverage. Um, and hopefully we can keep the uh, conversation, the dialogue uh, going. Uh, right Honourable Lord Mayor Robert Doyle from Melbourne, uh, His Excellency Ridwan Kamal, Mayor of Bandun, uh, Marilyn Taylor uh, from uh, the uh, School of Pennsylvania, and uh, Professor Young Gale, thank you very, very much for your comments today. I very sincerely enjoyed the response, and we will hopefully capture that as part of our final publication, which we'll be releasing at their Urban Land Institute's fall meeting in New York, and that'll be the physical uh, manifestation of all our work. So thank you, and please join me. Thank you. <laughs>